The views expressed on the following program are those of the hosts, callers, and guests, and are not necessarily those of WML staff, management, or advertisers. This is Joe Secker, folks, your host for Helping Seniors, the radio arm of Helping Seniors of Burrard County. The purpose of our organization is to educate, inform, and help connect seniors and those that care for seniors to services they need to try to do the best they can to age with some semblance of dignity. Now, I always remind you to have a pencil and paper ready so that you can jot down some of the things that Kay and I are going to talk about today. And I want to remind all of you that uh, everything that Kay and I talk about on the show today is really most most part on our website. And that website is Helping Seniors of Brevard. Dot org. All one word. Helping Seniors of Brevard.org. Our phone number to reach K at the office is 473-7770. And the radio number the number for the radio station here at WML is 631-1300. The people that help make what we tell you, what we talk about, help make it all possible. Some of our sponsors include Gentiva Healthcare, the Eye Institute, Solibite Dental Implants, Bill Johnson, Elder Law Attorney, WMEL AM 1300, and I like to talk about WMEL AM 1300 because for 24 years I've considered it a very elder-friendly station. And when we talk about elder-friendly communities, part of the way you become an elder-friendly community is to have elder-friendly communications, and WML has certainly been in our corner all these years, seniors. So those of you that want to advertise your business, here's a plug for you, John. Call WML, AM 1300, 631 tell you you want to be a sponsor. It's really, really easy, and it's a great market to get into. Also, Wustoff Hospital Systems, Levin Helm Care. And I hope a lady from Levin's going to call in, Dave, because there's got an interesting story she told us about, Dave, something, something you might want to think about when you talk about exploitation of seniors. Care, which is a medical alert program in Atlantic Shores Rehabilitation and the Social Club. It's a new daycare opened up at 5200 uh, uh, Babcock Street. And tomorrow we're going to film a pilot show for a new TV program, which I have discussed with the county commissioners, and they're working to give us permission to air another new television program on the Space Coast Channel. And the purpose of this new show will be to advertise all, all of the services, especially the nonprofit organizations that exist in Broward County that are supposed to help seniors. See? Our nonprofit organizations get county, state, local, federal, United Way money to help serve people. And if you, the potential users, don't know about who can help you and what services are available that can help you, how can you ever make use of them? So I know that's a lot of mouthfuls and it's a heck of a lot of talk. And today we might skip around a couple things because... Uh, you know, in the business of healthcare, things just continue to change all the time. So, without further ado, and I've talked about half the show away, not really. Welcome, Kay. Thank you. I'm a pleasure <laughs> to be here. <laughs> you want to talk while I catch my breath? Okay, you catch your breath, Joe. Well, you know, it's always a pleasure to do a program with you because I'm the one who takes the calls from the callers when they call the 473-7770. And I'll take the time to talk to you. And I'm not going to give you a quick number. In addition to that, you know, I ask my callers to call me back. Let me know how the resources that I have given you have turned out. The majority of them do. And if they don't, I'll call you back because I need to know. And, you know, we're trying to really be more than just um, 
m- more than just a resource. You know, we, we I almost take the role of a case manager, you know, because it's important that I listen to your call because I often find that a senior may call and they, they may be talking about one issue, but after talking to them in a few minutes, I discover they've got several issues that need to be addressed. So I try to finite with them, all right, let's talk about the most important issue that needs to be resolved here today. Let's get you in touch with the right resource that's the most important so that we can then move on to the next and the next and the next. Wait, well, you know, Kate, I, I've been um, talking to an organization that's a, uh, that's a, a new home health care organization that's um, – starting to open offices up, especially in Burrard County, uh, St. Lucie County, and Indian River County, and they're going to expand, I learned this morning, to other counties across the entire state of Florida. But one of the things that they're very, very big on, I met with them on uh, Monday, Memorial Day. Yeah, we're, yeah, folks, I worked on Memorial Day. and uh, <laughs> but, but I call it work, but it's what it really is. It's meeting with people to see if we can help, help more people. Yeah. And, but this company... Uh, is very, very big on uh, helping people connect with the VA aid and attendance program. Mm-hmm. And uh, for our listeners that don't know what aid and attendance is, uh, Kay, I'll but just give them sort of a okay. synopsis of it. I sure will. Well, I find a lot of widowed women, um, after speaking with them, and if they're on a very limited income, I'll point blank ask them, I said, was your husband... A veteran, as she said, and she'll most likely say yes. And I said, was he in service 90 days and served one day in war? Well, yes. And I said, well, you know, you may be eligible for aid and attendance. And she said, what's that? Nobody ever told me about that. So it's not like it's being... What is aid and attendance, Kay? It's going to allow that person, a widow or a, or a couple, I know we helped a couple a number of months ago get through the system rather quickly, um, incur additional income for their services and so forth. Now, I understand that, you know, that if they have more than $80,000, which does not include their car or their vehicle... Or their home. Or their home, okay then that there might be some restrictions on that. But I encourage people to really call me to find out about that because we can put you in touch with the appropriate people and, and move yeah. you through well, the system. Just, it, just be real specific. We have one couple, and, yes. and their total income was $796 a month plus $350 in food stamps. Right. Turned out they qualified for aid and attendance, and that entitled them to something like $1,790 additional income on top of their 796 So can you imagine, folks, yes. an elderly couple living on $796 in food stamps a month suddenly getting a new windfall of almost 1800 a month? Think of all the things it can do with That's that. That's amazing. And, and, you know, to be honest with you, Joe, people do not have to hire an attorney to to file for this. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. I, we don't want to take money away from attorneys, folks. But, you know, that's another thing. Kay raises a really good point. And when you get into this business, there's been so much in the paper about Medicaid recently. Mm-hmm. Um, right now, there are 55,000 people sitting here in the state of Florida on the Medicaid waiting list, waiting on that list to get their Medicaid card so they can get services. Um to me, uh, that's not good. No. And But so many people think, well, the only way I can get off that list is go to somebody and pay them a fee to get off that list. Folks, that's, it. yes, sometimes you have to resort to that. But please, please believe me. And this is when I need for you to get your, your pencil and paper out. There's a program called the Elder Helpline. Now, I'm not going to sit here in this radio station booth and tell you it's uh, it's uh, vanilla bean ice cream. It's not. It's not any kind of ice cream. But it can be. Mm-hmm. And it's going to take persistence, patience, willingness, hard work, and dogged determination to make this thing work for you most of the time. Sometimes you get lucky and it works real quick. But here's a phone number, and I want you to write it down. 
855-855-8770. That is the Florida help, helpline. That helpline rings over at the Re- Senior Resource Alliance in Orlando, and they have the responsibility for what goes on in Broward County. And see, the bad part about it, it's all done via phone. And I don't like that. Kate doesn't like it. Right. We get calls about it. So we found out, and I went over and talked to the people, and we've had some uh, mixed reviews. Most of the mixed reviews from this other service are caused by people maybe that don't understand or are not willing to put the time and effort into it. But there's a program called My Access. It's on Sarno Road. And that phone number over there is 373-0824. 373-0824 and they will help you with filling out your application for Medicaid. They will answer questions. They will make phone calls. And people that have done that and have called Kay and it's got back to me that things simply weren't happening. I call a contact in the Department of Elder Affairs in, in Tallahassee and this is what the woman said to me last week and this is the honest to God truth. The woman said to me, Joe, if you can get me the names and phone numbers of the people that are making the calls or not getting served, she said, we have a way of tracking to see if the Department of Children and Families and if ACA, Agency for Healthcare Administration, and our own people are doing their job. And she said, if we don't find out when people are not doing their job, we can't make them do the job. Right. So I know a lot of you listening know of sort instances where what Kay and I are talking about might well be true. So call Kay and give her the circumstances, and let's at least have a fighting chance to make something happen. See, so I might add, be- besides that... Access, our local access, it's not only helping with Medicaid, but they have a variety of different services they offer, such as helping you obtain food stamps, um, clothing assistance. Um, We mentioned the food stamps, medical service assistance. They've got a variety of services that they can offer for you. So if you you can't remember that number, I think you can remember to dial 473-7770. I've got plenty of those brochures even at the office. What what happened, folks? Kay and I both realize that what we talk idealistically about all these things the way they were, we know it doesn't always work the way we say it does. But if we don't know those instances where it doesn't work, we can't help fix the system. And that's exactly what the top person that I talked to in DOAA said to me. Joe, if I don't know, I can't help the people you're trying to help. But if you give me the information, I give you my word, I will follow. And folks, I know the woman speaks truth. She has a straight tongue, no forked tongue. Because she has personally followed up, fed the information back to Kay and me, so that we know the people are getting the help that they need. And talking about help that you need, um, there is a great, great misunderstanding from people about Medicaid. Um, You know, almost daily, I hear horror stories about people going to a provider or to an attorney paying anywhere from twenty from $150 to $6,000 to make this Medicaid application process work for them. You know, the reality is that the number that Kay just gave you for my access does exactly what those people that you pay all that money to are going to do for you. And that's the truth. Now, see, if you use the system the way we're describing it and it doesn't work for you, you can call Kay. Yeah. She talks to me. Right. We know who to talk to to make the system work for you. And that's why we started helping seniors of our bar and founded this thing back in July of 2011. 
you know, you know, Rome wasn't built overnight. It That's takes sure. time. It takes Absolutely. time, Kay. You know, and I'd like to share a story about a caller that I had worked with yesterday because it makes us a little, it makes us unique and and why helping seniors is really different. I received a call from a fellow who was a senior and he was living in an assisted living facility, but his doctor's office was right across the street. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. This is a good one, folks. Listen. Yeah. However, he was using a walker. And it was extremely difficult for him to open up the main door. By the time he got it open, the door was already shutting on him. So it was like, oh, he couldn't move that fast to get into that door. So, and he also said that the ramp that was there was not up to code. So what I did, I said, okay, I went, could you give me the name of the company who owns this? You know, if you've seen it on the building and so forth. And so I called. I actually got a hold of the property manager, spoke to her this morning, and she acknowledged the fact that, okay, the building was built in the 1960s. At that time, there wasn't the code that was required there is today. They were conscious of the fact that they're going to try to amend and change the look of the building and make it more accessible for people using a walker or a wheelchair. But it may take up to two years to get to that point. It's a long time. You bet. So in the meantime, we're across, they're across from an assisted living. So it's not just this gentleman that's experiencing problems. There's a multitude of others who have been complaining, too. So I finally said, okay, to the lady, I said, all right, there could be an easy way to fix this and fix it relatively soon. I said, do you have a maintenance man? She said, we sure do. And I said, why don't you call your maintenance man and have him adjust the hydraulics on the on the door itself so that it won't close as quickly? She said, good idea. I'll be on it today. So these are the kind of things that I take in consideration. And if I have a challenge, I certainly call Joe. But I'm not afraid to ask a caller, say, if you could give me more information, we'll get involved for you. Let's see what we can do to help remedy this situation. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about when I said I gave you phone numbers. You write the phone numbers down. If something doesn't seem right, call K. See, you know, you making that phone call might often solve the problem. But for the times that those problems don't get resolved and when... K calls and people know that we have a radio show, a television show, we're in uh, hometown news, senior scene, and now we're in Ebony News today. We had our first column in there last week, Spotlight right. Magazine. Media outreach makes all the difference in the world. And when the people that read our columns and our stories and the various media sources, when they know they can bank on what we say is the truth, it makes it a lot more difficult for those we approach to correct a problem in an easy way. It makes it more difficult for them to refuse. Uh, we have helped numerous veterans get ramps in their homes mm-hmm. or grab bars in their house. We have one caller that insists that they want a second toilet in her house, but we can't do that. That person's already been helped one time, and that's enough. Uh, we're not out to... Uh, create the Taj Mahal for every person in Brevard County, but we are out to try to make it possible for all of us to be able to live a better life. And I think, too, Joe, you know, when I make a call for an individual and I say, hi, my name is Kay and I'm with Helping Seniors of Brevard, well, the first question they ask, well, what's that? And I said, exactly what the name says. We're here, we're a nonprofit organization to help our seniors in Brevard. And myself as the information specialist, it's my job to put those callers in touch with the right resources or if they have an issue. It's my job to follow through, to find out what we can do to assist that senior because they may not know and most of them don't know now how to navigate the elder system. It's difficult. It's even difficult for me some days. And I never walk away in a given week without establishing yet another resource. So it's perpetual. It continues to grow. 
But the main thing is they know that when they call the 473-7770, we're here truly to help them. Yeah, and I think it's, we're almost at the time for the break, but when Bernard will stick his hand up and tell me to shut up in just a second. But before he does that, I just want to remind everybody that we, uh, we've we got this advocacy group uh, for to promote an aging plan for Bernard County. We're going to talk about it in that in the second part of the show a little bit so you know what's happening. But if you go to that website I gave you earlier, if you want to participate in a survey and you have Internet, you can access it. Take a survey for us. Help us get the information because when we take our plan to the county commissioners, the more information that we have from more of you, it will help make our our efforts valid. And that's exactly what we're going to try. We're going to take our, our going to take a sh- mid show break, folks. Stay with us. We got some things to talk about about Medicaid helping you and how you can help us help you. But we'll be back with you in about three minutes. Don't go away. Stay with us. Bye-bye. AM 1300 WMEL. This is Joe Steck, folks, back live with the second half of the show. I want to quickly mention our sponsors for the second part of the show because sponsors are what help us pay the bills. And uh, while I don't take any pay for this, uh, I have to pay K. So, and there's some other people we have to pay, but... Uh, we pay our bills, and these people help us do it. Senior Scene Magazine, Hometown News, Spotlight Magazine, Seniors Helping Seniors, Ebony News Today, folks, The Fountains of Melbourne, Beth Courtney of the Braswell Courtney team, they're a financial people, Kenneth of the Chiropractic, Canadian Meds of Melbourne, Wiedemann Malik, and Vitas Hospice, and Peaceful Beach Mediation. And this, folks, is something I just want to make real quick about this. Brooke Goldfarb is a uh, Harvard graduate, and she runs uh, Peaceful Mediation. And she's worked with um, court cases, uh, trial attorneys. She's done all kinds of stuff. But she got into this business of thinking there's a better way for seniors to try to uh, duke out their problems without actually coming to blows. So she uh, she just decided to form a a, a law firm that where you try to talk aboard the problems before they got to be uh, where people try to duke it out in the court. So that's what Peaceful Beach Mediation is. And then uh, if you want to call Kay at the office, she can give you a phone number to call Brooke over at Peaceful Me- Beach yeah. Mediation. That's It's important to know those things. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, you've heard me talk about elements of care over the years. And there's different elements of care, and there's different ways to access elements of care. And what Kay and I were talking about in the first part of the show, when we recommended that people call the office at 473-7770 or call uh, My Access Florida or call the Florida Elder Helpline, they're all put in place by the state and sometimes local government to solve the problem without it costing you a lot of money, without you having to uh, hire providers and case managers and uh, lawyers to make things happen. But sometimes that just doesn't work, and we have to resort to the most brutal methods of obtaining the care we need, and and that's sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time going to cost us. And that's a sad part of, of the whole system. But so many times, uh, like if you call Kay and, and laid out your problem, you might find through Kay's advice that you may not need the element of care that you need. Right. Uh, and well, you might even want to elaborate, Joe, with the situation with, um, and it's happened to a number. We keep hearing more stories about this, about individuals, and we spoke about this last week where you know, a man or woman really is trying to go with um, Medicaid and Medicare and so forth, and then they're paying extraordinary amounts to an individual or a financial advisor or an attorney to basically get them into a skilled nursing facility while the Medicaid is being approved, and then taking them out of there for 60 days after 60 days and into a... um, 
assisted living, you know, it's it's just a shame. It, it's when the person really needs is assisted living, not skilled nursing. If they if they can't see well, but yet they're they've been living independently for quite some time, they want to need just a little bit higher health needs, and being an assisted living, not skilled nursing. And then I hear stories about people being put in the hospital that necessarily don't need to be in the hospital because they want to have a private pay to pay for that bed. Yeah. So well, it's it's just not right. I know you've talked to that individual's well, son on, on that situation. Well, we've got is uh, we all know that nursing home care is exorbitant. We also know that uh, not all nursing homes or assisted living facilities are equal. Right. Some are better than others. And despite what we want to say are requirements for staffing levels for certain cases in nursing homes or assisted living facilities, we find out that the staffing levels are not being met. Ergo, the the patient is the one that suffers. So Absolutely. all the times that you and I have talked about this, Kay, or I've had Bill Johnson on the radio show or we talk about it on TV, yep. we always tell families, go to the nursing home or go to the assisted living facility at different times of the day or the evening. I was just going to say yep. that, Joe, because the staff will recognize, well, it's 1 o'clock, here she comes, so let's be in our best behavior. But if you go in at various times, you may be surprised to see what you may discover. And these are things that people don't think about because they're on a given schedule thinking, okay, my father or my mother is expecting me at X amount of time. Shake it up a little bit. It's really important that you see what's going on because you are not going to be maybe reported. And I hear time after time of callers telling me that their mother or father is in a facility and they discover later, hey, you know, they're not really getting the proper care. The CNA comes in and, and is in a rush. Hurry up. Let's go. i got to make my rounds and everything. So it's just I've seen it even firsthand. So it's it's a matter of really trying to take that responsibility yourself and yep. shake it up a little bit. There are laws, folks, and we all know that not everybody observes a law. But many times people are afraid to report a situation because they're afraid of the outcome. Right. And that's a sad thing. But again, that's why you have the Florida Ombudsman's programs. That's Mm -hmm. why you have helping seniors. That's why you have county commissioners. This is why you have uh, the elder helpline, the elder abuse line. Right. You don't have to get your names, but if you've got a situation that's not right. Report it. Yeah, if you don't do something about it, we're never going to correct the situation. For example, if uh, in a nursing home, if uh, you, uh, not all people eat as quickly. Some people require to be spoon fed. Right. And if you're a family member of a person who requires to be spoon fed, you might have to go to the nursing home at several times a week mm-hmm. to ensure that the people, your, your loved one, gets their food. Right. Because uh, nursing homes simply cannot, will not, do not for any number of reasons, often have the staff to sit there for an hour t- to get a person to eat a 12-minute meal. They just can't do it. And you know what I might add, too? If you drive around a nursing home late at night, look and see how many cars are actually parked in the parking lot. That'll give you an idea how much a staff is on duty. Yeah, you got a point there, too. Yep. But see, what we're saying, folks, is... When you transfer somebody and put them in an element of care, whether it be a small or large assisted living facility or a nursing home or something like that, or even in a hospital, you just can't wash your hands of your responsibility to ensure that the necessary care and attention is, in fact, being given to that person. So it's a hard call. It's a difficult call. Uh, But I'm going to tell you this. There are laws that preclude 
hospitals and nursing homes and assisted living facilities from discharging people for other than the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And if you have a situation where somebody is tossed for something that is not a good reason or a legal reason, that's when you need to talk to us. That's when you need to talk to the uh, ombudsman or the abuse or an attorney, a trial attorney. That's a Uh, red flag, folks. Yep. You know, because if somebody's putting put in the hospital and the hospital says there's nothing wrong with them and they're sent back, it, it, there is something wrong with this picture. So pay attention to that kind of thing. Yeah. And under the under the new laws that have been enacted both at the federal level and at the state level, uh, all of us, all of us folks are getting bad advice. We're getting yep. information that while we want to think it's true, it simply isn't true. Uh, a good example is if you if you look and you read read a paper, those of you that didn't see the articles by uh, Speaker Chris Foley and uh, uh, Professor Murrow from the Eastern College, they were in Florida today over the last couple of three weeks. Uh, if you didn't read the article, go to your internet, pull the articles up, and there read them. Go. The Speaker of the House is talking about a $33 billion Medicaid part of the roughly $76, 77000000000 billion for our budget. So I started doing some research, <laughs> and I thought, are they talking Florida share or a combination of state and Florida? The $33 billion is a question of state and federal money, 40%. Florida, 60% state. And that's that's the way budgets are developed. State money, federal money. We, as long as we know where the money's come from, we, we can we can build a budget. Right. But what we don't know is that there's all this that's gone on about the House and the Senate and this expansion where we are going to help the 800,000 to 1 million Floridians who don't have insurance and are going to qualify under Medicaid Mm -hmm. to get some level of insurance as to whether it be a silver, gold, or platinum plan, whether it would pay for anything, whether it would do anything, that's a horse of a different color. Absolutely. But let's just talk about the money part right now. My my question was, what are we going to use that money for? Good question. It is a good question. <laughs> you bet. So I called the Speaker's office, asking questions. Didn't get a good answer. Called Tallahassee. Didn't get a good answer. So I called another legislator's office, and I got a beautiful answer. And this should make you all wonder, too. In the current Florida budget, and I've got the pie chart sitting right here in front of me, of the current twenty. Billion, and we're talking about 2014, 2015. There is $20 billion in the Florida budget for Medicaid folks. Yet we're asking for $33 billion for next year, and that doesn't even address the expansion costs, which the Senate mm-hmm. and the House have not agreed on. Right. The question then becomes one. Do our legislators really understand where this money is going? Now, some of you might say, hey, Joe's getting in a political show. This is not politics, folks. This is money that's supposed to be used to take care of people that, in the main now, not all, Mm -hmm. but in the main, are 65 or older and qualify as a poor person. Right. And we're talking millions of people in Florida, several million. That's a lot of people. And when we talk about $33 billion in there for Medicaid, yet in the governor's budget we see $2 million, not billion, but $2 million to remove people off the community care for the elderly waiting list of 55,000 people. Hmm. That two million people is going to help four hundred people. Hmm. We're not we're not really making a dent in the problem K no. at the state level, just as we're not doing at the federal level with our budget. And if people start thinking about that and start asking questions, where where is the money 
for the senior care going? What's it, what are we getting for this? Well, it, and if I can bring it down to the local county here, Go Joe, ahead. you know, we had formed the advocacy council here and so forth and coming up with a, a written plan and everything because those are just tuning in. We do not have a written aging plan in Brevard County. And it makes me wonder if Brevard County is looking at, you know, with going by the AARP standards of 50 plus, it almost accounts to one out of every two individuals in our county. And it's only the baby boomers have started to enter the senior market. It's only going to get bigger. But to have a budget in our own county, not to mention what you're talking about on a state level, of one-tenth of one percent. And yet our seniors are crying out there. The, the amount of calls that I get for people, like you said, living on seven ninety six a month, that's a combined income. Yeah, right. they're getting food stamps, but how are people surviving? You know, it's just I, I a tell you, okay, I'll tell you how they're surviving. Yeah. Because there are, are, there are organizations right. like the Space Coast Center for Independent Living that exactly. help with transportation, the Barard Alzheimer's Foundation that gets mm-hmm. state money for respite care. They go into homes, and at least they did, they go into homes to help and sit with people while the primary caregiver gets a break. Right. Uh, Aging Matters has the same program. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, are, there are other... Uh, uh, if people just simply go to our website and take a look at the assistance sheet, you'll see yes. you'll see organizations that do exactly what Kay and I are talking about. Right. But I'll also ask our media person that monitors our website to put the development of the aging advocacy plan on the net so that those of you that want to be involved in helping define what it is we think the seniors need in Brevard County to make Brevard County an elder-friendly community, and that's what the purpose of the show is. Right. Information, education, and connection. Yes. If people don't know about the services, if they don't understand what the services are, and if they don't know where, where we, what we have and how to get to them, right. the, all these services don't mean a darn thing. That's a, absolutely true. I think the number of majority people, especially those who are in a limited income, they don't have access to a computer, a newspaper, et cetera. You know, they're in the really dark. So they'll call us. They found out through a friend or someone told them, call Helping Seniors at Brevard. At least maybe you can try to get be put in the right direction. And I hear the frustrations. I mean, I've had people actually cry on the phone with me because okay. they're hurting them. I, I, uh, you know, I get frustrated, too. I get yeah. frustrated because I know that there are so many people out there that don't know how to wind their ways through the system. And they get stymied, they get upset, they get, get angry. Right. I get mad. I get mad when, you know, folks, I'm going to tell you, I, have, I, 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 I never tell you anything unless I sort of test it myself. I have dialed that elder helpline myself. I have waited. The last time I called, I waited 33 minutes, and at the 33rd minute, I got dropped. And I didn't have the gumption to get up and go to start it all over again that day. Mm. So what I did was I called the guy that runs the thing and told him what his people are doing to me over there. See, I can do that. But imagine the frustration of the average senior out there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And and it's just, it's frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. But, you know, for all the complaints we talk about, uh, uh, people aren't getting help. Uh, It was... uh, we have one lady, you were, you were telling about a story about a lady that needed the um, the air filter. Oh, yes. <laughs> that, that, share that with her. Let's just, okay. I think this is, this is interesting. Well, it's interesting because I work with this lady almost from the day we opened our door. And she actually has taken a proactive um, in for effort to even be on our Senior Advocate Council because she is so grateful that she has received some help. She wants to give back. She had actually waited more than eight years to get approved for Section 8. So Section 8 housing. Section, yeah, excuse yeah, make me. Sure I you make sure I say housing, housing, not some nut house. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> very, very good for clarifying that. But she was very concerned because she has a number of health issues, including COPD, and she's allergic, she found out from her, her doctor, to mold. 
So she was determined the fact that she, she she there's mold in here. She can't breathe. She's catching her breath. She actually hired a handyman to go up in the attic and took pictures. So we knew that it was something that needed to be addressed. And I, you know, I made a number of calls. I won't tell you to what agency. And we got her on the waiting list. And I pleaded with them to try to put her on the top of the list. Well, lo and behold, miracles do happen. Because one thing that she was after, she said, if I could only get an air purifier, I know that's going to take the particles out of the air. And I know I can breathe a lot better. Well, she got her air purifier. And I followed up the next day after. She says, I had the first best night's sleep I've had in a long time. So little things like that, folks. You know, we're, we'll try to you do whatever we can in our power to make your life and age with dignity and, and live in a healthy environment. Yeah, we're almost out of time, but I want to tell a quick story about a, a call I had this morning. A guy uh, complimented us in our articles in Hometown News and said that uh, we're on the right track and pointing out some of these things so people have a better idea of understanding how they can help themselves. But he said, I'd like to ask you about your endowment. He said, how are you doing on that? I said, slowly. I said, there's so much other stuff that needs to be put in place. So I said, we're working on getting something that we can raffle off that uh, the proceeds from the sale of all the tickets on this item will go into the endowment. He said, that's a great idea, Joe. Mm. I said, yeah, I know it can be done. I, I said, I just know it can be done. But uh, it's going to take people like you, once we make this happen, to spread the word to get people involved. He says, you can count on me to do that. He said, I don't have a lot of money. But he says, I can make phone calls and I can talk to people. And that, 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 you know, talking and being involved and saying, I want to be part of the solution, not the problem. Makes Absolutely. All the difference in the world. And I think that it's important to let our listening audience know what an endowment fund is and how it would be don't, used. Don't. You know, we had a situation not that long ago with a fellow who was making a very limited income and would could not chew his food. He had to rely on baby food. So... The board chipped in with the initial endowment fund, from what I understand, and got him dentures. And the guy couldn't be happier. So this is what an endowment may provide, you know, for those who really can't help themselves. But come on, that's that's a matter of dignity, a matter of health. You can't live on baby food forever. No. You know, and just being able to chew again just changed his life 180 degrees. Yeah. The last comment, I'll make. I'll take a last one. I'll pick up one Kay was saying. Folks, if you do decide you want to contribute to the endowment, you can call Kay at the office, and she can tell you how you can do it. You bet. But I can give you my word that the money you contribute to an endowment, that the principal will never be used. We'll use the interest off the principal to help people so that that thing will continue to grow and make more care available as we try to meet the future needs of people in Bard County. So, with that comment, I want to thank everybody for listening today. We'll be with you next uh, week. Bill Johnson, the Elder Law Attorney, will be on our show. So have a great weekend, and thank you, Kay, for being here today. Thank you for having me. Thank and you, th- everyone. Thank you, John, for operating the keys. You and Vern. He's waving to me, folks. That's the video part of his show. Bye-bye. <laughs>